Good afternoon and welcome to Vermont House Judiciary Committee. It is Tuesday, January 25th, and we are here to continue, continue our discussion on S30, an act relating to prohibiting possession of firearms within hospital buildings. And we are joined by our legislative counsel, attorney Eric Fitzpatrick, um, that is gonna walk us through a, um, a draft that, a uh, proposed draft that amendment that incorporates the, um, the changes that we spoke about when we um, last uh, took up this bill, which I believe was last Thursday. So hopefully everybody um, has that for folks who are watching. It is draft 2.1, uh, that's dated 123-2022 at 5.07 p.m. That's what we're gonna be um, working off of with Eric. Good afternoon, Eric, welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon. How are you today? Good, thanks. Well, good. Hope you are. Yeah. Thank you. So draft 2.1, the not amendment. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So uh, th this is Eric Fitzpatrick with the Office of Legislative Counsel and here to, as the chair said, uh, discuss and walk the committee through a proposed amendment to to a, an amendment itself. You may recall the last time we talked about this bill, there was an amendment uh, proposed by Representative Knott. So what you'd be looking at now, version 2.1, is a strike all to that amendment. So there are some changes to that proposal of amendment that are highlighted in yellow, uh, which I can walk the committee through. Does that make sense, uh, Representative Gred? Yes, thank you. Yeah, sure. So uh, I'm going to share my screen uh, so that we can take a look at the language. And I can, uh, as I go through it, if it makes sense, I can sort of mention, even though we, we've gone through those sections, it might be helpful just to have a quick refresher of what they are as we go through, if that makes sense. Yes. And here we are, I'll just say, as I always do, that when I'm sharing the screen, I can't see anybody um, visually. So if you have a question or want to interrupt me for something to ask for a clarification, whatever the case may be, please please just interrupt me. Don't wait for me to pause because I, I can't see whether someone's raising their hand or wants to, wants to interject for a moment. So uh, having said that, so as I mentioned, this is version 2.1 of the uh, proposed strike all amendment from Representative Nod, and uh, walking through each section one by one. The first one, uh, this was uh, S30, if you recall, as it passed the Senate, included this section, section one, which prohibits the possession of firearms in hospital buildings. And I believe that the only change to this section, I'm just skipping ahead for a second just to make sure, but yes, all right, just confirming that, that the only proposed change to the language that you looked at last time, and in fact, which, which is the language that passed the Senate, is to change the penalty. You see, that's the highlighted language on lines 10 and 11. As the bill passed the Senate, and as it was in the previous version of this amendment, uh, the penalty for possessing, knowingly possessing a firearm while within a hospital building uh, is a one-year potential incarceration and a $1,000 fine, which makes it a one-year misdemeanor, essentially, uh, a one-year misdemeanor with a $1,000 fine. So the proposal, uh, the proposed change here is to get rid of the uh, potential incarceration period and drop the fine down from $1,000 to $250. So it would be a fine only crime of which there are others on, in, in law as well. Uh, it's still a crime because it's phrased as a fine. It's not a civil penalty, in other words, it's a crime. Uh, fine or it stays Sorry. a misdemeanor. Pardon me, go ahead. Yeah, it stays a misdemeanor. Correct, exactly. Thank uh, you. Yeah, sure, yep. And, uh, and so, yeah, as I say, that's the only proposed change between the language that passed the Senate and what you looked at last time and the version that you have in front of you. Otherwise, it's, it does the same thing, which is uh, we mentioned earlier, 
prohibits a person from knowingly possessing a firearm while within a hospital building. We'll move on to section two now, not seeing any other, or not, sorry, not hearing any other <laughs> questions. <laughs> I won't see any, as I mentioned. <laughs> the uh, uh, Section two has to do with uh, uh, background checks for firearms purchases and specifically with the default proceed process, which we've talked about in committee as well. Uh, the default proceed process is a, is a part of um, the requirement that background checks be conducted when firearms are transferred. And there's a there's a, both a federal requirement for that and a state law requirement for that. Under federal law, the background check has to be conducted whenever a firearm is transferred uh, by a federally licensed firearms dealer known as an FFL. Uh, and under state law, the, buyer, the fire background check has to be conducted for private purchases between uh, private parties with, with some exceptions for family members and, and things like that. But generally speaking, that's the way it works. And the way the background check is conducted is that the, the dealer, even in the private transfer situation, um, the background check is, con is conducted by the federal dealer. The two parties go to the dealer and ask them to perform the check. And the um, process for it involves contacting the National Instant Criminal Background Check System, known as NICS. And when, when NICS provides uh, the, the transfer, they're contacted by telephone or on this or through, uh, through the internet. Either way, if the, per, if the <coughs> transfer is, if they don't find anyone in their initial examination of their databases, if they don't find any disqualifying criteria, in other words, they don't find that the person is prohibited from possessing a firearm, they assign a unique identification number to the transfer, they give that to the firearms dealer and, and the transfer proceeds. So when we say default proceed, what that means, that refers to a provision under this federal law, under the background check law, that provides that if, if the NICS system uh, can't provide a unique identification number within three days, in other words, if they can't give the dealer an affirmative uh, a conclusion within three days that this proposed purchaser is not prohibited by federal or state law from possessing a firearm, uh, so, and I meant three business days, sorry, it's not three calendar days, it's three business days. If they're not able to um, make that uh, <clears throat> uh, statement to the dealer within three, three business days, then the firearm <clears throat> transfer can proceed, uh, even though uh, they, it's not in a sense, they didn't provide them with a unique identification number yet. So it's, uh, it's referred to as a default proceed because uh, it proceeds anyway, even though um, the affirmative statement about the person not being a prohibited person hasn't been obtained. It's, uh, um, as I say, a portion of federal law, but because the state uh, background check statute is tied into federal law, it applies also uh, to transfers with it between private people who have to do them by using a, a dealer also. So the proposal is, uh, and this is unchanged actually in this new amendment you're looking at, there's no proposed changes to this language, but just to refresh everybody's recollection, the proposal is that that three day default proceed be increased to 30 days. So if you look at uh, lines nine through 12, the way it would work is that it's not that, it's not that it couldn't proceed after a period of time in which there's no definitive answer, it's that it extends that period of time. So that if they don't get an answer from NICS, within 30 days, then the transfer may proceed. So it essentially provides uh, NICS and uh, FBI with a longer period of time to determine whether or not the person is prohibited. And as I mentioned, no changes to that section. Sections three and four are connected. These uh, deal with the uh, emergency risk protection order that uh, passed the legislature a couple of years ago. This is the process, which I'm sure the committee remembers well, which permit, allows a state's attorney or the attorney general uh, to obtain a court order uh, prohibiting a person from temporarily possessing firearms if there's a finding that the person poses an extreme risk of uh, danger to themselves or others through the possession of firearms. Uh, the purpose of this uh, section of the bill was to, uh, and this, this passed the Senate. In fact, I think it, now that I think of it, it passed the legislature. Sorry, did, was, did somebody have a question? 
No, nope. I don't. Oh, okay, I thought I heard somebody, sorry. <laughs> uh, but anyway, so this uh, portion, this section of the bill uh, passed the legislature previously in S-169, uh, but that was vetoed by the governor for uh, a different reason, not related to this section, but uh, the veto uh, statement involved the waiting period piece as the reason for the veto. But this piece was in that bill. And essentially, it arises out of uh, concern expressed by some healthcare providers that they uh, uh, want to be certain that they could provide the sort of information uh, to a law enforcement officer that goes into uh, an, you know, the decision that a state's attorneys would make about whether to file for one of these orders. But the healthcare professionals were concerned that um, they didn't they would be able to do that without violating the federal healthcare privacy law HIPAA. Now, uh, there is language in HIPAA already that arguably already permits this disclosure. And in fact, when I, I mentioned this, <clears throat> I discussed this section with our healthcare attorney, Jennifer Carby, and I mentioned what the purpose was. And she said, well, can't they already do that under HIPAA? And I said, yeah, I, I think arguably they can. And that's because um, if you look at lines uh, uh, two through four, that is just a verbatim repeat of what of an exception that exists in HIPAA. So a healthcare provider may notify a law enforcement officer when the provider believes in good faith that disclosure of the information is necessary to prevent or lessen a serious and imminent threat to the health or safety of a person or the public. That's just copied verbatim from a HIPAA exception that already exists. It says that uh, uh, disclosure is permitted in that, you know, emergency situation. Um, but there was, you know, it isn't exactly the same language as the language that's used in the ERPO statute. And that, that language in the ERPO statute is in lines 10 through 13, you see? So that permits disclosure when the healthcare provider, uh, or sorry, not the healthcare provider, but the, starting with a reasonable belief. So that's the standard for ERPO. And when a person reasonably believes that the patient poses an extreme risk of causing harm to themselves or another person, um, by possessing or purchasing a dangerous weapon. So, you know, at first, at first blush, the, the language of both the HIPAA piece and the ERPO piece certainly seem to be addressing similar circumstances, but it's not exactly the same. So that's why I think there, there was a, a, a concern among some healthcare providers that they wanted to be absolutely certain that the disclosure would be permitted without violating HIPAA and that's why this section exists. You see what it does, is it essentially defines the federal HIPAA standard, which is in lines eight and nine, to include the, um, the state ERPO law. So it's just you know, essentially uh, making that connection absolutely clear so that it couldn't be, someone's not gonna be concerned that, well, this may meet the HIPAA standard, but it might not meet the state standard. Well, we define one to include the other, so it's clear that it does. Um, You'll see the one change is to do with the definition of healthcare provider. Uh, this was uh, an issue that had come up in committee last time, concern about uh, that term and what it might include. So I also talked with Jennifer Carby about that. She suggested uh, changing the, because healthcare provider is defined in several different places in Title 18, which are the healthcare statutes. Uh, she suggested uh, changing that definition, uh, or changing the cross-reference, I should say, to refer to a different definition, which is slightly narrower than the one that you had used before. And I had, um, uh, had asked Amber to post, and she did uh, a document that shows you the two definitions, just so you can see uh, what the change is between uh, the two reference definitions of healthcare providers. So the one on top, you'll see, is from draft 1.1 of Representative Knott's Amendment. In other words, that's what you looked at last time. And the, the uh, definitions are essentially the same except for the facility or institution language. So in the, the version of it that, you, that was in the amendment last time uh, defined healthcare provider to include a facility or institution. Whereas the one that's referred to now in the proposal specifically does not include facilities or institutions. You see that that's subdivision seven at the bottom there. Means so, Eric, partnership. Uh, yes, I, I know that yeah, I know this language kind of narrows up who uh, 
you know, could potentially uh, report somebody or whatever. Um, so, so I guess a little more detail on how it does by, uh, by eliminating uh, facility or institution. Yes, and um, uh, fortunately, um, Jen explained a little bit of that in an email to me, which I'm gonna read a little bit of to you so that um, to okay. respond to your, your question, Representative Berta, because I, I had the same question and, and asked her and she, she gave me a little more detail. <laughs> and so, she's been working on healthcare stuff for a long time, so. <laughs> that's for sure, exactly. She yeah. certainly knows far more about it than I do, certainly. Um, so uh, yeah, it's a, it's a really, what it boils down to is the difference between an individual and an institution. It's almost like, a, I think it's with the, with the um, Division of Racial Justice Statistics Bill, we've been talking about the word entity, for example. It's a similar concept that, that by uh, the, the definition on the bottom that's in the amendment right now that excludes facility or institution, there's a lot of entities that are gonna be excluded. Yes, you'd still would include a partnership or a corporation, we know which would it's meant to include, you know, healthcare providers who are basically in business together. But facilities or institutions are, are excluded. And I'll read to you uh, what Jen said. It's the, the, the institutions are, it's from the definition of the things that are excluded, for example, because um, you see how it says other than a facility, right? Well, in the same statute, facility is defined. And that means all institutions, whether public or private, proprietary or nonprofit, Joffer, diagnosis, treatment, ambulatory care, et cetera, uh, and the buildings in which those services are offered. So according to Jen, that means that um, the definition means uh, individuals. So you are including individuals and businesses licensed, certified, or authorized to provide professional health care, but you're not including hospitals, nursing homes, home health agencies, et cetera institutions like that, which makes sense because this statute is about a person's ability to make a, an individual disclosure to law enforcement um, without violating HIPAA. So it's, it makes sense to ex exclude institutions like that because you're, you're really just, the whole purpose of the section is to provide individual healthcare providers with the ability, or at least with the comfort level. I mean, arguably they already have the ability, but at least with the comfort level uh, to know that they could make a disclosure like this and not be charged or sued or in other ways subject to negative consequences for committing a HIPAA violation. So that's the distinction really. Thank you, that's, that's helpful. I wanna just make sure that that's clear to committee members. Uh, no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Eric, can you just kind of cover it again? I, I think this is one of those things I'm going to have to hear two or three times before I, I quite get it. So, right, right. Um, well, the uh, the it's really a, 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 a an exclusion of. So, in other words, the the entities that aren't included in this definition, the one you're looking at now, facility or institution. Exactly, and that's going to include th that's going to include things like hospitals, nursing homes, home health agencies, et cetera. And I'll read some more just because we're looking at a, a more detailed definition: nursing homes, health maintenance organizations, home health agencies, outpatient diagnostic or therapy programs, kidney disease treatment centers, mental health agencies or centers, diagnostic imaging facilities, independent diagnostic laboratories. Cardiac catheter, catheterization <clears throat> laboratories, radiation therapy facilities, inpatient or ambulatory surgical diagnostic or treatment centers, um, hospitals, general hospitals, mental hospitals, chronic disease facilities, birthing centers, maternity hospitals, psychiatric facilities. Um, these are all excluded. So these these do not these will not be a healthcare provider. And again, the idea is that. Those are all those are all institutions, right? And the idea here is to um, uh, provide individual healthcare providers and um, um, and their businesses with the ability to make a disclosure of certain information without feeling that they might be violating the federal healthcare law HIPAA. So it, there's some logical sense there, and that's what Jen suggested. Says, aren't you really trying to get at 
individual healthcare providers, you don't want to have all these institutions in there because they're not, you don't make a disclosure as an institution anyway. It's a person who would be doing it. Um, so, okay. Yeah. Does, does that make a little more sense? Yeah, a lot more. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, yep. Just kind of curious at uh, a couple things on the list. You said something about a mental health um, uh, Agenc agency or center, yes. But okay. remember, remember that the, that doesn't mean the individual mental health care provider would still be covered. It's the it's okay. the agency. It's gotcha. the it's the it's the entity that wouldn't be. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. Great. Thank you. Yeah. So, sure. So going back to uh, Eric, it's Ken. Going back yeah. to the um, what I asked, uh, I think last time on D the DCF. <clears throat> Yes. building that we've we've had a situation there how's that relate to this that i also followed up with with jen and asked her that question as well and, and it's a similar answer and that and that i, I think this is kind of what uh, you were getting at representative gosselin is that the again an individual someone who works for dcf let's say and they are a person who provides uh you know mental health counseling services they would be covered they they would be they would be included in that definition now, the agency itself, as we're just saying, as an entity, not covered. But but yes, an individual person who is, and let's go back to the, just so we can look at um, the language in the bill. Uh, uh, oops, sorry. Did I miss that? Oh, yeah. Sorry. So I meant right here. So yes, uh, it's a person, partnership, or corporation after the highlighted, highlighted language licensed or certified or authorized by law. So assume that it's uh, you know, a licensed uh, mental health counselor, for example, working for uh, um, DCF, yeah, that person would be included in this. They, they, would be able, they would be able to make the disclosure without violating HIPAA. I think that's kind of what you were getting at. Am I, am I remembering it right? Yeah, yes, thank you. Yep. So Eric, with, with this language, it would it would uh, eliminate, say, just for an example, the orderly in in uh, the emergency room. Correct. I asked I asked Jennifer about that as well. They would not be covered. No, because that's not a licensed or certified position. Um, right. They're not providing right. <clears throat> professional healthcare services. So no, yeah. that person that person would not have the ability um, to make the disclosure. But on the other hand. Um, it, it's probably true, and again, I'm I'm not a HIPAA expert, but probably an order we had a hospital isn't covered by HIPAA anyway. I would think, um, you know, maybe it all depends on what the individual's responsibilities are. Are they providing healthcare services in some way? But they might not be covered anyway. But it, it, either way, that might not um, have been the best example. But uh, but I I see where it's going anyway, and. Uh... I, I think it's a really good thing. I think this is a great amendment um, to uh, to narrow it down to, to people who are qualified. Yes, that's right. Exactly. The idea is that they would be licensed or certified, and you know, obviously, that's a certain level of of uh, of professional job requirement. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Good, thank you. That was helpful. Yep. So, um, yeah, I think that that uh, completes that ERPO piece. Although the next section is also related, it's just a reporting section that also is identical to um, the language in S one sixty nine. Although, no, wait a second. Uh, yeah, that's right. This is an S one sixty nine also. So this is a a reporting requirement that the court administrator with the assistance of AHS report data on, on the use of purpose, you know, the, the amount that have been filed and uh, the number of orders issued, whereabouts in the state they uh, were filed, that sort of thing. So it's a, a reporting requirement regarding these extreme risk protection orders. Section five is highlighted because it's it's new to this amendment, but uh, at the same time, the committee did look at this language last uh, Thursday also in the context of, I think uh, it was an um, amendment representative grad brought to everyone's attention 
because it has uh, uh, been passed by the legislature before actually. This is a, a section of law that was in effect uh, for a period of time, but then it had a sunset attached to it. So it has since, um, has since been repealed. And this section has to do with large capacity ammunition <laughs> feeding, feeding devices, uh, you know, high capacity magazines, which, and this language that you're looking at here, that's not underlined, that's existing law. So you know, starting on line 15 through 20 there, that's existing law. And that's the law that prohibits um, you know, possessing, manufacturing, transferring uh, these high capacity magazines, these large capacity feeding devices, they are prohibited generally. Now there's a number of exceptions, you remember, that we discussed this. And, and <clears throat> one exception that was in the law for a while, but has since been repealed is the one that it's in subdivision F right now, lines seven through 13. And there's actually a typo here. Uh, lines seven through nine uh, should all be underlined. This is a, 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 a holdover from a previous version of this. Uh, but the, the language should all be underlined because it's, it would all be new, even though it's Line seven through nine have actually been law before, before the sunset kicked in and it was repealed. But because it's repealed and it doesn't exist anymore, we're essentially enacting it again. So that should all be underlined, uh, the entirety of it. And, uh, and the uh, term, you'll see one proposed term in line eight, the law as it existed before, had the word established. So in other words, this exception to the general prohibition on, on um, the high capacity magazines is uh, permitted for bringing one into the state by a resident of another state. This is line seven through nine, the first paragraph, paragraph one, um, for the exclusive purpose of an now organized shooting competition if the device is lawfully possessed under the laws of the other state. So that was the exception that had existed before before the sunset. In other words, if a person was lawfully in possession of one of the uh, large capacity uh, feeding devices in another state, then they could bring it into Vermont for the purposes of one of these established shooting competitions. And that was uh, the idea of how it would work. The proposal here, and which you looked at last time, reenacts that piece with the change of the one word and also adds to it. So it's not just gonna be folks from other states, but uh, people in Vermont as well will be able to use them for the organized shooting competitions. And that's what paragraph two does, lines 10 through 13. And so this provides the same exception for, for Vermont residents who, who wanna participate in these shooting competitions, provided that you see lines 12 and 13, as long as they lawfully possess the device on or before October, October 1st, 2018, because when the original prohibition was passed, that was the grandfathering date. So that if you, if you had one, as of that date, then it wouldn't be prohibited. It wouldn't be illegal to still keep it. In other words, you didn't have to, you, nobody, just because they were illegal going forward, that didn't mean that people were gonna have to get rid of the ones they already legally had. So uh, this ties into that grandfathering piece. In other words, it's, it's not gonna be legal to use them at one of these shooting competitions if you buy it later on, you know, after that October 1st, 2018 date, that's still gonna be illegal. But if you legally had one before, then you can use one at these competitions just as uh, the folks from other states can use them as well. Now, another slight change that was made to the language that you looked at last week here is in lines um, 11 and 12. <clears throat> you see there, it had said before uh, organized shooting competition, um, and it didn't have any of the language starting on spot with the word sponsored on line 11. And so this is clarifying that, you know, who is it that that would be uh, putting on these shooting competitions to make some qualification as to who they would be run by. Um, and the languages, and I think the committee discussed that uh, last time in concept, and I ran it by <clears throat> David Hall, who's our attorney who uh, works in the commerce area and works with the, um, the corporate entities and how they are written in law and registered with the Secretary of State's office. And he proposed this language which is to say that um, it's an organized shooting competition sponsored by an entity registered with the Secretary of State and authorized to do business in the state. And that's boilerplate language evidently that they use all the time in the Commerce Committees when they wanna refer to these business entities. And so it's gonna include 
corporations, nonprofit corporations, LLCs, limited liability companies, um, you know, all these different business entities that are required to register with the state. And uh, they're all listed quite clearly, quite clearly in um, several titles of the Vermont statute. So it's, a, as I say, this is standard language that's used when you're referring to these uh, organizations. So uh, it's just um, used again here to make clear that that's who the competitions would need to be sponsored by. So just to be, just to be clear in, in, uh... In my thought process here, has the organized shooting competitors, have they, is this a known fact that they've always had to be registered with the Secretary of State? The competitors themselves don't have to be registered. It's only no, it's the, the organizations, is that, has that always been in effect? <clears throat> uh, I, I'm, I'm going to leave it to the witnesses will know better, but I'm assuming that the answer to that is no, if you mean by the, by that, you know, because prior, you know, right now, whenever these shooting competitions took place, as far as I know, there was not a requirement that that they they had to be sponsored by an entity registered with the Secretary of State, and maybe some of them were. Uh, I just don't I don't know the answer to that, but but there, this legal requirement I don't think existed. So this will be this would be. A new requirement going forward that if you're uh, an entity that sponsors one of these competitions, um, then uh, presumably uh, they'll need to register unless they do already. I mean, that, that, I think my guess is you know you you would know better talking to some of the witnesses who who are familiar with these competitions. But I, I my guess is some of them are already sponsored by such organizations. But uh, I don't know that for certain. So the second, I'm sorry. I just, just in terms of context, this language, um, um, one of our witnesses, Chris Bradley, had um, talked about it originally, and, and um, this was his recommendation in terms of entity registered with the Secretary of, of State's. Um, oh, that's what he said? Yeah. Yeah, so, and then Martin, yeah, so I, I had an email exchange with them yesterday and over the weekend to confirm essentially this language. Uh, which should, if it's not already posted, I, I sent it on to Amber to post so you can see the exchange with uh, Chris Bradley. So that's that's where this language largely came from. Is he on, by the way? Not on Zoom. Um, he could be but, listening. Uh, but probably is yeah. um, As well as um, uh, to me and the representatives, probably listening this as well. I can I can forward you that email as well. Uh, and, Yes, I'd appreciate that. Thank you. Um, I'm sorry, uh, Alicia, you had asked. Um, yeah, I'm a little concerned with the, after the Secretary of State, the word and authorized to do business in this state. Um, I think there could be, I don't know, I think there could be nonprofits, I think there could be unorganized ranges that are so not authorized to do business, so not doing business, um, they could still be organizing and sponsoring a competition. Um, I know for several um, different occasions, a local range has sponsored um, a shooting competition as a fundraiser for different events. And they're not an entity that can do business in the state. They're not registered with the Secretary of State. It's a local, organization that gets together to, to maintain a range. So I, 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 I don't like the and, and I don't necessarily think that the entity registered with the Secretary of State as well meaning as that when it's not a is, is really relevant to, to all the, the current and potential space and standardized, organized competitions that, that, that are happening. So I wanna make sure I understand you. So if, if you were to write it or, or tell me again what you don't think is necessary. Um, I think organized shooting competition is, I don't know. I don't think that registered secretary of state or authorized to do business have any relevance with 
who can and can't organize um, a competition. And that just concerns me because some ranges are nothing more than some people get together with a group of land and have an agreement as to the main maintenance of the land and people can participate in that organization. But if that's not, <coughs> not always registered as Secretary of State, that's not always something that is authorized to business. So first, yeah. so firstly, if we keep the Secretary of State language, I really have a concern with keeping the and authorized to do business in this state. Because so could there be maybe this is more for Eric, would there be anybody who's registered with the Secretary of State but not authorized to do business? Uh, I don't know the answer to that. I, I can check with David though. Um, yeah. Yeah. But I think, Tom. you know, if, I think that there's probably, uh, you know, if, if the idea is to, um, to, you know, put a qualifier on, because of the fact that this is an exemption to something that's otherwise illegal, you know, otherwise the possession of these devices is illegal and you're, you're creating an exemption. So if the idea is to say, well, we're, we're okay with the exemption, but you want to have it affiliated with an entity, a, a, a known entity of some sort, I think, you know, it's probably correct that you don't maybe even need that second half of that phrase. You know, the, the fact that the entity is registered perhaps gives you enough of the, um, uh, you know, the fact that, that the, it's a, 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 an entity that um, is official in that sense. And uh, whether or not they're authorized to do business is maybe less relevant than the fact that they're registered. Yeah. I mean, I might, hold on, Martin. Tom had this. Yeah. Um, I, I do know that the sportsmen are very comfortable with this language, you know, after consulting with their, with their council. And uh, I, I would hate to, and, and I'm not saying that a, a potential change is the right or wrong thing to do. Um, and uh, uh, but I, I guess before any changes were made to this language, I would I would like to hear from the um, from the uh, Sportsman's Federation, and maybe Martin has something. To add yeah, to and I think we can scratch that that language the the after the and. Uh, we didn't think that really added or subtracted to anything, and that's not language that I passed by uh, by Chris Bradley. It was it would okay. be with the Secretary of State, and I don't think there's any problem in just scratching the and authorized to do business uh, in the state. Okay, and then, then then it's the language that Chris Bradley uh, saw and approved through whoever he went to. Okay, okay. So I, I'd be fine to do it, and, and I guess I have another question uh, related to that language. Uh, Eric, uh, I'm wondering if we if we need to have that language in the uh, previous section F1, or or if it's fine just to have it in F2. No, you need to have it in F1. That was the other thing I was going to mention before we moved on yeah, to the next so, topic. Well, those are well, those are two changes that you know get rid of the and authorized to do business in the state and move the sponsored uh, by language also to F1. Does, exactly. Because they need it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Any other comments or discussion or questions on, on this on this section? I guess. Sure. Uh, <clears throat> this. Yeah, Eric. Not being a person who owns uh, one of these large capacity magazines under uh, on line uh, 12, if the device was lawfully possessed on or before October 1, 2018, are these magazines uh, date stamped or time stamped or anything? Or is this just an honorary system? How does that work? It's it's more of an honor system. Uh, I mean, it's it's they are not date stamped. Uh, it's yeah, so. But nevertheless, that language is consistent with what we passed uh, as far as the, the ban, that there was a grandfather in any, any uh, large capacity magazines owned before that. So yeah, I, you know, enforcement is that there are gonna be strong enforcement on this from outside of individuals uh, doing the right thing. <clears throat> with both the next question is, how do you enforce it? It's not time to think. Okay, all right, thank you. 
Yeah, sure. Uh, so moving on to then to section six, this is this is a a section that is new to the amendment, although not new to the committee. Uh, you may well recognize it. This is actually uh, directly uh, pasted from uh, a bill that the committee passed last year, and which the House passed actually H one thirty three. So this is the language from. Sorry, did someone have a question? Uh, yeah, I was kind of having a little side meeting, and I didn't, I wasn't paying attention to what uh, the question Bob asked about the high capacity magazines. I, I did hear what I think was part of it is that with, were they marked with like anything uh, to identify them? Was that was that the gist of the question? Yes, and I think the answer was they're not. So it's you know it's essentially whether or not you possessed it on on that date is more of an honor right, system okay. than anything. Right, I, I didn't know if there was anything else to that because I had a question around the um, uh, the high capacity magazines also. And okay, uh, you know, let's fast forward 30 years <laughs> when none of us are in the building, right? <laughs> um, right. So fast forward 30 years, competition is going on. Um, out of staters, uh, uh, you know, competitors from out of state can bring in high capacity uh, magazines. Um, by then, we're 30 plus years into the uh, uh, um, Vermonters not being able to buy new 30 round magazines. Um, I'm going to guess in 30 years, if they're used enough, they're going to be worn out. And, and that means at the competitions, uh, Vermonters won't be able to compete in the out-of-state out competitors will. Well, it must, uh, it must, oh, you mean if they're not functional anymore? Yeah, yeah, because they can't, they can't buy new being in the state. Uh, yeah, that's a possibility, I guess. Uh, depends on, uh, I'm not, I don't have the technical knowledge to know how long these things can last or whether they can be repaired uh, to continue to operate. Right, right. I'm not really sure, but. Uh, yeah, I mean, everything mechanical wears out eventually. True. And, uh, that's, that's all I'm getting at is, is, is uh, I don't know, I don't think it's hypothetical that at some point in the future, Vermonters won't be able to possess the 30 round magazines and compete in their own competitions. And I don't know if it's something we have to address in this bill, but I, I think at some point, maybe it should be addressed just because of that reason. So kind of, yeah. the, the, same, the same rule applies to all the staters bringing their high capacity magazines into the state. They're not supposed to be bringing new high capacity magazines. It's those lawfully possessed on or before October 1st, uh, 2018. So everybody's in the same boat, presumably. All okay. honest people. Uh, right, okay, yeah, yeah, no, I see that now. And uh, so I guess at some point in the future that it's, if, if the competitions are gonna continue, that it will have to be addressed because everything mechanical wears out in time. Fair enough. Yeah. yeah. Just, yeah. yeah, no, I'll just say I don't think we need to address it now, but I, I do agree with you that, yeah. well, this is fine now, and, and I'm happy with this way it is now. I do think that right. actually that's, that's something that does need to be addressed or correct. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> okay, um, thanks, Eric. You can keep going. Sure. Um, so yes, as I was saying, this this section of the bill was was previously passed by this committee and and by the yeah. by the House uh, in H one thirty three last year. It has uh, not been acted on in the Senate yet, so it's still the bill is still in the Senate. But I'm sure you remember it. It has to do with uh, emergency relief from abuse orders, and you know, the those RFAs are uh, an existing process in law that uh, allows the court to issue a um, a relief from abuse order when uh, a family or household member has demonstrated that they've been abused by uh, another 
family or household member and that, uh, that there's an immediate, immediate danger of future abuse. And there's a list of uh, uh, provisions that one of these emergency RFAs can contain. That's existing law lines starting on line six through line 18. That's all the stuff that it can be in current law in one of these orders. And uh, the proposal in H-133, you probably remember, was to add to that. You know, the existing pieces include you know, no contact orders. You can't contact the person or the person's children. Yeah, you can't uh, abuse, continue to abuse the person, uh, hurt any of their animals, interfere with their personal liberty, et cetera, et cetera. And it adds one additional uh, piece that uh, can be in one of these orders, which is that the person who's subject to it, who's been found to be uh, uh, committing the abuse, and I'm on lines 19 through 21 now, uh, directing the person to immediately relinquish until the expiration of the order. And I should point out that the orders are have a maximum effective period of 14 days. So uh, after at the end of the 14 day period, they have to try and obtain a permanent order, which can last up to a year uh, or it expires. Uh, but either way, um, this temporary order would last for a maximum of 14 days. Um, and the idea is that uh, it requires relinquishment of any firearms in the defendant's possession, ownership, or control, and to refrain from acquiring or possessing any firearms while the order is in effect. Uh, so I think that's probably familiar to everybody. It's uh, an, an additional provision in the relief from abuse order section uh, that the committee has seen uh, and talked about last year. And the proposal is to add that section to this amendment as well. So nothing, nothing has changed from what passed the house. Correct. Okay. Okay. Thank you. And the effective uh, date is July first of twenty twenty two, and uh, and that's that's everything that's in it. Okay. Great. Thank you. So we actually um, are going to hear from um, Chris Bradley. Um, he represents the Federation of Sportsmen, I believe. Um, yeah, so he does um, have the Zoom link and he'll be, um, just, just so we can ask him um, about taking out the, uh, an authorized business language, just since he was the originator of, you know, of this language. Um, and I worked with him when I wanted to bring this concept back in, so. Okay, so great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Shall, shall I leave the screen up? Or do you want me to take the screen down or? Um, well, Chris is in. Um, let me welcome you. Chris, are you there? I realize we can't. Well, actually, Eric, if you could take it down for a second, that way we can see Chris. Yeah, sure. In the state. Okay. And then, then, then it's the language that Chris Bradley uh, saw and approved who whoever he went to. Okay. okay. So I, I'd be fine to do that. And, and I guess I have another question. Uh, Related I'm to sorry, that. Chris, Chris, you're not muted. I'm wondering. Uh, I am not muted. I'm just waiting for a break. In the uh, previous section, F1, or or if it's, that's you. YouTube. Oh, you're gonna have to shut down your YouTube. That was the other thing I was gonna mention before we move down. Well, those are two changes that you know get rid. Okay. <laughs> I'm I'm here if I can be of assistance. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, you have we can hear your live live stream as well, so that's why we. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much for for calling in. So we are um, looking at um, the new um, the language on page seven of draft two point one. Um, so line ten talks about possessed at a news and an organized shooting <clears throat> sponsored by an entity registered with the Secretary of State and authorized to do business in this state. And there was um, concern about the authorized to do business in this state. Um, so just um, your thoughts on, would it be okay to take it out? Is there some reason that you would want it uh, in there? Well, um, I, I Yes, a, uh, an original testimony and in response to a question from a Representative Knott, um, I uh, off the cuff suggested that perhaps a registered entity with the Secretary of State may solve the dilemma because there seemed to be a question of who, not what, where, but who 
was sponsoring this event. So uh, again, off the cuff, I suggested the Secretary of State as a registered entity that would cover uh, the Vermont State Rifle and Pistol Association, which was my main concern. Um, it is my understanding that um, uh, the member clubs of the Federation are all registered entities. Um, so uh, I believe we're, we're covered with the registration uh, with the Secretary of State. I, I have to say I'm a bit confused between uh, the Section 1 and Section 2 under F. Um, I, I, it just seems like one section is needed. Um, as I understand it from uh, Mr. Fitz, Fitzpatrick, the first I clause was to allow people from out of state to do this, to come in for the purpose of a competition. And as I understand number two, it was to allow in-state people to do this as well. There's nothing preventing in-state people from doing it. They can do it already. If they already owned a large capacity ammunition feeding device, they can use those in competitions right now today in Vermont. We now have an issue though with Vermonters being able to use these in competitions, but people coming in from out of state are prevented from doing that. And we've lost competitors because of that. They don't wanna break the law. It's, 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 uh, these are very law abiding individuals. So I, I, I had suggested Secretary of State it almost seemed, and I, frankly, I don't think we have any uh, difficulty with that language. Um, it just struck me that those two sections could really be merged into one. As originally proposed, <laughs> transported by a resident of another state into the state for the exclusive purpose for use in an established, uh, excuse me, organized shooting competition sponsored by an entity registered with the Secretary of State. I, I, I certainly am not a, a legal person, but it, it, I think that would cover cover what we are, our concern was. I think, I think that's true, but I'd ask Eric. Eric? Thank you, Eric. Thank you, thank you um, Chris. Thank Eric? you for allowing me to speak. Yeah, don't, don't go away, please. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I promise. So Eric, what do, you, what do you think? Yeah, I think that's a, a very good point. Um, I think yeah. Chris makes a good point there. I, had, I hadn't Notice that, but uh, I think he's right that uh, you don't need subdivision two because uh, if people are already grandfathered in, then they can already use them at shooting competitions. It's uh, they wouldn't be prohibited under the existing law anyway because they're already subject to the October first, two thousand eighteen grandfather. So um, you really you really only need one subdivision Ro Roman numeral one. Uh, with the addition of the registered with the Secretary of State language um, that he mentioned. <laughs> uh, I think that probably covers it. So Eric, how would it, um, how would it read if we were to um, merge these, take out some language and merge these two together? It would just read, so subdivision two would, would go away, that wouldn't be there. And you'd have subdivision one that would read transported by a resident of another state into this state for the exclusive purpose of use in an organized shooting competition sponsored by an entity registered with the Secretary of State um, if the device was is lawfully possessed under the laws of another state. And that, that was assuming that we weren't including the and authorized language. I didn't, I'm not sure I quite heard a conclusion on that, but I, I was assuming that, but I'd, I could go either way. I would suggest if you're registered with the Secretary of State, that's the purpose of registering, so you can do business. But that would just be my observation. I think it's fine to strike that language. <laughs> um, Martin, go ahead. Yeah, I, um, I think it'd be fine to strike the and authorized to do business in the state. Okay, and um, and what about the October? I think that that raises the question again that uh, Tom had earlier, and, and I don't know that we need to address it right at this moment, but it, it may be, <clears throat> I guess the question, do we, do we say lawfully possessed on or before October 1st, 2018, or do we say under the laws of another state? That would be the question. The only thing, the only thing I would add there is that you had mentioned earlier, Representative Lalonde, 
that lawfully possessed on or before October 1st, 2018, by my read, does not apply and, and did not apply uh, to the provision about people coming in from out of state for this. That was added only when the idea was to cover folks in Vermont because you because Vermonters are the ones who are subject to that that grandfathering date. So not that you couldn't add it, but it, it wasn't subject <clears throat> to that date before. Right. It's already there for us to it's that October 1st, 2018 is already law. So the only thing that we're really worried about is making sure people comply to Vermont law, correct? Yeah, but that law only applies to, uh, you know, in other words, we can't say to somebody in New Hampshire or Maine, you know, you can't possess a feeding device unless you had it before October 1st, 2018. Um, that grandfathering only applies to people who possess firearms here in Vermont. Um, and there, ha okay. there had been this exemption for people who came into the state for these shooting competitions. They weren't subject to that grandfathering date. As long as they had it lawfully uh, <coughs> under the laws of their own state, they were okay. Um, now, the, now, in a way, I suppose maybe it wasn't at the time. It probably wasn't considered because when the when the um, when the exemption was first written and put into law, it had a sunset, <laughs> so everyone knew it was going away anyway. So it, it didn't really matter so much. You didn't really have to have that grandfathering piece because it was only going to be in effect until uh, I can't remember what the what the sunset was. Maybe it was the same date, October first, two thousand eighteen. I can't recall. Um, uh, but uh, um, in that sense, maybe maybe since it wasn't something that was considered one way or the other because of the fact that it was going to sunset, you know, maybe it's something that you want to think about now. You know, do you want it to be, for example, I think this is kind of what you're getting at, Representative Gosson. Let's say. The person buys a person in Maine buys their, um, you know, their uh, large capacity feeding device, you know, tomorrow. Can they bring it in for a shooting competition, or does it have to be something that they possessed before October first, two thousand eighteen? I mean, you're kind of on the honor system again, anyway, right? <laughs> but. Um, so, I guess that's the question. I think we've identified. Two problems in, in uh, <clears throat> as far as people possessing the large capacity magazines, and uh, and uh, my own opinion is that if we allow, as long as they're legally purchased in another state, and if we allow them to bring up, bring those into Vermont, we eliminate one of the problems we're talking about uh, um, fixing in the future. Um, and, and, and if we did that, uh, the only problem we would need to fix in the future is uh, somehow, and I have no idea how, allowing Vermont competitors to uh, uh, purchase or replace um, the high capacity magazines that they have now. So I guess, I guess my question is, and I'm a little confused, I don't know which way we're leaning on the, yeah, on the language, is, is if we're going to allow out-of-staters that legally possess their magazines to bring them in. For shooting, we have to tie For shooting, we, we, right, we right for together. shooting, for yeah. shooting competitions. But it's, it's, it's the October um, 2018. Um, I, I mean, I think we leave the language as it is in F1, that it's under the laws of the other state, and we we make sure to make a note that we need to address this further. I don't think it becomes an issue for a little while. No, no. Uh, and, and we're going to get lots, you know, we're going to get more clarity in the next couple of years on, on the ban itself, frankly, right. with what's going on in the uh, Supreme Court and such. So I think it's fine to have the language under the laws of another state. So uh, not, not, not tying it to October 1st, 2018. 
Well, okay. So as long as they're purchased legally in another right. state, yeah, just okay. Just okay. Yeah. That, that fixes that problem. Right. Right. Now, okay. so I think I heard Mr. Brown. They start to speak. Uh, I'm not sure. I'm curious of what he he might have to say. If I, I if I, I guess. Would. I, I certainly don't mean to obfuscate, but I'm still leaning towards one section or eliminating the two and simply yeah. say if the device is lawfully possessed, period. Right. But that way it's lawfully possessed in Vermont. It's lawfully possessed wherever they came from. It's lawfully That's possessed when an out-of-state person comes into the state for the purposes of a competition. If uh, possessed at and used at an organized shooting competition sponsored by an entity registered with the Secretary of State and authorized to do uh, Secretary of State, comma, if the device is legally, is lawfully possessed, period. Yeah, that's, Chris, that's the yeah. way that we're leaning is, is, to, is, is to go to the lawfully possessed. Then that would apply for wherever their home state was, that would apply to them while they're in Vermont, and it would equally apply to all Vermonters. Yes, as long as it's lawfully possessed, yep. So Eric, does that, do you have any questions yeah, I didn't, about that? I, I guess I'm still not quite sure um, <clears throat> what the com committee's pleasure is here. Can, can I give yeah. a shot? Yeah. So uh, I think it is what you had read before, Eric. It's uh, transported by a resident of another state into the state for the exclusive purpose of use in an organized shooting competition sponsored by an entity registered with the Secretary of State uh, if the device is lawfully possessed under the laws of another state. That language may, would make it lawfully possessed while it is in Vermont, even if they purchased it last week. Yeah, but you as long as it was lawful in the state from which they came. Right. Right. But, but again, going back to lawfully possessed means it had to be lawfully possessed already in that state. Right. So we don't even need to have in that state language, do we? Well, I think we do have to have that to make that clear. I think that, that we do have to make that clear. There would be some confusion There'd be some confusion if they were bringing it into the state. Right. With, with, with that, with, with that language, uh, as far as saying naming the state, would that uh, allow this new law to cover Vermont's law the way? We're... Well, I'd ask that, to Eric. I think that's the idea. Okay. Yeah. I thought that's the way you were going, but yeah, I think. Yeah, I think that that uh, as, as Chris was saying, Vermonters are already covered. Yeah, you don't even, this law uh, provides oh. the ability of out-of-staters to come in and participate in these competitions. But Vermonters are already covered by the existing grandfather stat provision. So anybody in a Vermont resident who has one of these devices and had it before October 1st, 2018, mm -hmm. they can already use them. They can bring them to the competition and use them. Um, uh, so this was intended to, you know, because some of these competitions, you know, bring in folks from out of state uh, to be able to allow them to still come in and bring their bring their high capacity devices without violating the law. So yeah. I think though that you do you do probably do need that <laughs> under the laws of another state language because if it just said if the device is lawfully possessed, it creates a, a potential ambiguity there because well that means. You know, if the person comes into Vermont and they're bringing a device from New Hampshire and they just bought it last month, well, technically that's illegal in Vermont because that's not grandfathered in. So uh, if you just say that, so it's no longer lawfully possessed, but if it's lawfully possessed under the laws of the other state, if they bought, if they bought it in New Hampshire and that was okay, then they're okay, even if they did just buy it. Um, that's the way I read it anyway. Um, yeah. yeah, I have a question for Eric and, and quite possibly uh, Chris, and maybe Eric can answer. So <clears throat> basically, we seem to be having, if I understand this, a large discussion over language on something that, in all essence, is unenforceable in Vermont because it's all based upon an honor system from this law that was created back in 2018. Is that correct? There's no time state. There's no damp on the, uh, stamp on these magazines. 
So we're talking about something that really, unless they say, yeah, I did it, is unenforceable? Well, I think you're right by the last point you brought up that, that um, it's enforceable to the extent that people comply with the law and they, you know, and they're, they're uh, um, honest about what they're, when they bought it and that sort of thing. But I think you're right. If somebody is, is uh, going to be dishonest about that, then um, you couldn't rely on their statement, but you know it's conceivably possible that there might be evidence. You know, let's say there was a witness who knew that the person bought it last month. Well, then might you might still be able to enforce it against the person, even if they they lied about when they got it. That is a case in, in the state, Bennington. That's right. Uh, but anyway, my second question is is going back to Tom's question. Uh, so I'm not all that familiar with this law that either is or is not enforceable in the state of Vermont. But when it comes to uh, purchasing of magazines, maybe Chris, you can answer this. Say it's a, a metal magazine. Is there anything that precludes individuals from, I mean, about the only thing that's going to go on these magazines is loading spring and, and the loading plate from purchasing those parts and still, and, and still using them in their 30 round plus magazine. It's not the magazine itself that they're, that they're replacing. Um, you raise a very interesting point, sir. Um, you cannot buy a complete high capacity, new high capacity feeding device in Vermont due to this law. Mm -hmm. uh, um, parts are available and are not regulated by this so law. That's just years down the road. Yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, no, not uh, the parts are not regulated. So if you and I, I don't want to get down in the weeds, but there are essentially, there's a body to the magazine, there's a spring, there's a follower, and there's a floor plate, four pieces. You can buy the spring and it's not a magazine. You can buy any one of those component parts just to replace something that broke or otherwise just to buy it. Um, and it would be possible for someone to, under Vermont law, illegally assemble a new high capacity magazine feeding device. Okay, thank you. So um, what I would um, like to propose, Eric, so you're, you're clear on which, which way we're going in terms of proposing in terms of the language, correct? In this yep, section? I'll, yep, I'll set. Okay. So what, um, so what I would like to propose, if this works for you, Eric, um, can you, you know, redraft it with, with that language? Um, and then also, I guess, the underlining that, that wasn't um, carried over, if that makes sense. And, that would be draft would be 3.1 3. or 2, <laughs> that'd be 3.1, right? Yes. Um, okay, so um, could we take a break while you do that? And then that way, because um, I do have a schedule for a possible vote, I would like to vote on this, but I think it's important for many members to, to, see, the, to see the language. On this, yeah. um, so Eric, um, if we came back in 15 minutes, is that doable for you? Uh, yeah, I'd say 15 minutes is doable. <clears throat> can we get rid of the, uh, 17? Yeah, quarter, I'm sure, right? <laughs> yeah, should we get rid of the, uh, the highlighter highlighting in it as well? Have a clean copy? Is that possible? Well, here's, okay, here's a, you're, you're voting on now a rep proposed amendment by Representative Knott, correct? Mm hmm Okay. Um, so, yeah, we can get rid of the highlighting, but, um, I think, as you know, as a matter, of, like that's an amend, that's a proposed amendment to the, to the, uh, Senate bill, right? Right. Right. So then the committee would have to vote on whether it wants to amend the bill in the same way, I suppose. Right. We'll be voting on three point on on three point one, and then we'll be right. voting. Well, I guess if right. you voted. I guess my point is that if you if if the vote were favorable, would, yes. then the final doc the final document would be a committee amendment, not not an right, amendment right. to one one member. Right. Right. So so we would start by uh, by voting uh, on the whole amendment, or are we just gonna uh, uh, would we be voting on what we've been discussing now? We have to vote on the whole. Okay. The whole thing. Okay. Well, we have to vote on the whole thing. Okay, the whole amendment. 
Yeah. 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 Like, right. Like, like this whole thing. Yeah. The, all the all the pieces of it. Everything that was added is an amendment. We would vote on that. And then we would still have to vote to pass out. Right. S thirty is, is so we got your necessary. We got your amendment. We're voting on, and then we vote on the final. That's S thirty. Right. That's how I understand it. Okay. Yep. Makes sense. So this this language we're talking about around the high capacity magazines become part of the not amendment. Right. Okay. <laughs> okay. Great. All right. Thank you. So quarter hour. Okay, go ahead. Thank you. Welcome back to House Judiciary Committee. We had a, um, a short break uh, while our counsel, Eric Fitzpatrick, uh, was drafting uh, new language that we have been discussing. Uh, <coughs> Eric, good afternoon. Um, good afternoon. Hi. So um, do we have this language? Does Amber have a language? What's the best way for us to, to look at it? Yes, I think. Okay, so, um, so our committee assistant and um, Amber does have it. We'll email it to us and then also post it. Yeah, thank you. Copies? Okay, great. And... Uh, So we're just taking a, a minute or so to have the email pushed through and then uh, is everybody who wants a, in the room who would like a hard copy? I don't need, hmm? I don't need one on this. This will be, it'll be draft 3.1 when we get it. I'll, I'm, I'll be good with that one. Oh, thank you. <clears throat> so, um, please. Well, I'll yeah, take I'll take it. So I just realized that I forgot to change. I forgot to change the uh, the version, the draft number. Um, but it's either I can I can do that now. It'll take me a minute, or you can just say, state that you're voting on draft three point one, and I can change it afterward. Either way, sorry for the mix up, but. Uh, um, I'm sorry, I was <laughs> <laughs> So Eric is saying that um, everything else is changed except for the number at on top. So we could either state that we're voting on 3.1 and then he would change it after. Yeah, is, or, uh, to me, as long as all the language is right, I don't look at that as a big deal. Okay, then we could change it afterwards. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah, Eric, we're good. Um, we're good. Um, Looking at something that says two point one, knowing that it, that that it'll be changed to three point one, that that's that nothing else in the actual body of the amendment needs to be um, needs to be fixed. It's just that that number up there. Yeah, it's just in, just in the just the version number and the header and the time. Okay. Right. So in our when it's posted to our. our our page will be will it say three point one. Why don't I just send it right now? It only take a minute. Okay. I, I I already changed it. So okay, thank you. Um, yeah, <laughs> I like that. Yeah. Okay, you'll need your uh... 
Thanks for that reminder. This is the first time I've been here. Yeah. Do I get a cold star or anything? Do I have a charter? Okay, Amber, I, ju I just sent the revised version. Thank you. We're doing 3.1 first, right? Um, correct. Let's see. Edit. Yes. I'm still not seeing our mini page, though. Yeah, it takes a moment. Okay. We'll okay, thank you. Refresh, it should be there. Okay, thank you. The system's very slow today. Yeah, <clears throat> there it is. Yep, there it be. I still don't have it, but anybody else does? I do not as well. Okay, thank you. And then um Yeah. Yes, I got it. Well, no, just... And then folks still want um <coughs> So three, 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 three copies. I want this. Yeah. So remember when you're able to think it's just good. Um, so I'm confused. <clears throat> when I'm going to S30, draft 3.1, when I, when I push on it, it comes up draft 2.1. Yeah, so you're like me, you it, it hasn't come up yet. I haven't refreshed yet. Oh, right, yeah. <laughs> That's what I have to. Yeah, the, the email I was sent says 2.1. I just posted that it said that. Eric, did you send the one that you changed the header? You, you did? You were, you were muted, but I, I think I read. Yes. Huh, okay. Yeah, mine says 2.1 yeah, also. We haven't gotten it yet. Huh. What's the email say? I don't think the email says 2.12. Yeah, I just forwarded that. Exactly. Eric, are you sure you sent the right one? Okay. Uh, Yeah, yes. I, when I open the one in, in my sent email, it says 3.1, but I, I can try again. Thank you, everybody. I like watching grass grow. <laughs> Paint dry. Mm. I'd like to watch grass grow. Mm. Unfortunately, 
I think he originally was in the line. Yeah, a little longer now, that's all. <laughs> Maybe we're waiting on you. You can let him know that um, <laughs> it's going to be at least uh, like 15 minutes or something. <laughs> um, thank you. All right, let's try that again. <laughs> okay. All right, just send another one. Thank you, Eric. Sure. <laughs> no, that'll be right. No controversy, potentially. What an agenda looks like. I swear I had to make it work for an agenda. I don't know what happened to it. <clears throat> Where's the ice? Oh, there's an ice box. Did you say he sent it? Actually, he did say he sent it. Oh, I'm the cafeteria. And the first little um, Yep, there's these cups and there's that one cooler. Yeah. 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 So, do you, do you want to send it, Eric, to the, all, all the Judiciary Committee? Sure. It doesn't have it yet. Uh, all right. Yeah, I just. Amber, do you not have an email that says version 3.1 on it? I didn't get another email from you. Huh. Strange. <clears throat> Well, I don't have a list, sir, for the entirety of the Judiciary Committee, so it's going to, I can send it to everybody, but um, Amber, why don't you send me an email and I will reply to it with the document attached. Can you try that? All right, I just got your email. So in theory, this should work. <laughs> Thank you. All right, I just replied to it with the document. Got it. Great, no, thanks. Amber's attachments. Um. Mm -hmm. Nope, that's not right now. I don't have it. It's all still coming in the backyard. How many pages in Colorado? Huh, okay. <laughs> My family gone. So, um, that's not even a big one. So, Amber's going to try to meet. Please? I can't, I can't hear you. I feel like there's a lot of background noise. Uh, so, Amber has not received it. Do you want to send it to me, please? Uh, so you didn't get the reply email I just sent? No. You don't get that on your oh. I'm not a computer wizard, but have you got a lot of emails in your outbox sent that hasn't been, been sent? Uh, yeah, but it, there, it, it, it indicates that they have been sent. In my outbox. All right, Martin and Maxine, I'll, I'll just try and send it to you to see if you get it. How's that? Sure, that'd be great. Thank you. Because when I click on it, it pops up like this in Outlook. <laughs> <coughs> Open and page. I think that's a setting you have on your phone. Yeah, but does it allow you to move it though afterwards? Hmm. 
setting I have on my phone. All right, I just sent it to both of you. Okay. I think Eric is lost in the matrix. <laughs> You're not getting it? Not yet. I'm going to. Um... Oh, I got it. <laughs> I got it. I'm forwarding it. Sorry. Wow. Yeah, I'm just so sorry. Slow, slow, slow. Yeah, it's a big, big lag. Oh. Just stay behind on their email payments. <laughs> <laughs> that must oh, be. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there must be because there are guys who haven't gotten it. Huh. But That's weird it's, because it's, 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 yeah. Strange because when Amber sent me hers, it came right away, but it must be something that's sending slowly from here. Our constituents will be happy knowing that we even have major problems in the state house with. <laughs> And everybody said you forwarded. Yeah, I'm gonna try again. It's not even in my outbox. Would you send it to everybody in the email? Yep. <sighs> Nope. I, uh, I think if we uh, get some monks' drives, that might be faster. <laughs> right now. I got the one from 253. Yeah, I know. Excuse me. Are you also posting it, uh, Amber? Maybe that's a quicker system. Maybe that system's quicker. Well, this is, we should definitely speak to IT about this. this. Yeah, I'm sending them an email right now. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. They might get it tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> like Ken says, tell them to pay their bill. <laughs> pay half the bill, you only get half the speed. Oh boy. <laughs> Again, thank you all for work. <clears throat> Many members here and on Zoom and public who are watching for your for your patience. Hopefully, uh, right now. take care of this. It is, it is important not only for us to be able to see what we are looking at and voting on, but but the public as well in terms of our our website, regardless of of the bill. You know, just I'm. Happy we're in this room going through this because if I was in my home office right now, <laughs> this computer would be through a window. <laughs> so, Martin, I just forwarded you something regarding your racial stats. And that yeah. I should. Did, you, did you get that? I did. I did. <sighs> We've heard that before. <laughs> Refresh your pages. <clears throat> Got it. Oh. It's correct. <clears throat> All right. So, yeah. did, did the emails yeah. ever go out? I never got your email. He you didn't. I never got email. Not, not yet, at least. Uh, but that's right. fine. It's not. It's posted though. We we got it. Yep, I got it on the committee page. <laughs> so we got that much. 
So I think all we need is three hard copies. So on the committee pages, uh, draft 3.1 without lighting. And once we get our hard copies, the language, um, I believe, is on page seven, <coughs> which is now um, it's just. Um, So while we're waiting for um, hard topics, just for a few of us, if folks do want to look at this this language, so it looks to me it looks good, Eric. But yeah. other folks uh, take a look too. So page seven, line seven. We have now one F. Um, it used to be F little i and two i, and now it is thank you combined. Thank you, Amber. Okay, that, <coughs> and that is the um that is the only change, correct, Eric, other than taking out the uh the highlighting. Yep, that's it. Exactly. And it's not three point one. Make sure you remember see the See that language. Well, the, the the public, this is for public view now too, right? The public can see it. Chris can see it if he's still there. Um. Yes, it is on our main page. I am still here. Yes. Uh, Chris Bradley, president okay. of the Federation. Chris, do you have the language? In front of you, um, I have it from the website. Yes, um, I see nothing wrong with this language whatsoever. Good, Good thank, you. thank you. Thank you. So I just want to make sure every committee members on Zoom and here all have three point one, and I've seen the language. <laughs> Okay. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you to the witnesses, committee members. So I would entertain a motion. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I would. I would move to amend S thirty uh, as laid out in draft three point one. I'll second. second. Okay. Thank you. Um, any discussion? Um, 
Sure. Not comments. really discussion, just sure. comments. Um, yeah, comment, I guess. Committee comments. Um, yeah, yeah I, I certainly, uh, you know, the changes that, that we've made today, I, I certainly appreciate the committee's work on it. <laughs> and I think, you know, those, well, the changes we made, I, I think it's, uh, they were important. And, and uh, you know, and, and in my, my eyes, certainly, um, a positive direction anyway, but that, that's all I got to say. Thanks. Thank you. Any else? Um, I, it, in the same vein as, as Tom's comments, I do really appreciate the collaborative work on, on sections of still that do make significant changes for Vermonters and, and that work is appreciated and I'm glad to be a part of that. Well, thank you and I, I do very much appreciate everybody's work on, on this bill. Uh, those who support it and, and do not support it, but I, I really do think it shows that our committee is really a, a good functional committee. <laughs> but I appreciate it. Anybody else before we vote? Any discussion comments? <coughs> Anybody on Zoom? Nope. Okay, then um, the clerk shall commence to call the roll, please. Holborn. <laughs> Yes, I'm never prepared. I'm always expecting Coach to go first. I'm sorry, but yes. It's this voice that messes you up. Donnelly? Yes. Bo Slant? No. Ballon? Yes. Luffler? No. Norris? No. Not? Yes. Rachelson? Yes. Christy? Yes. Verdict? No. Brad? Yes. Seven, four, zero, vote. Okay, thank you. And now, in terms of uh, amending S30. So I, I would move to approve uh, S30. As amended. As, as amended. As amended. I'll second that. So, do folks understand this vote? Yeah, just want to make sure. Okay. Um, any discussion or? So, just to be clear, what yeah. draft number? What are we using for? So it's it's still um, it's still three point one strike all amendment. Okay. We need to do the roll again. Yep. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Just catching up. Yeah, yeah, that was fine. Okay, ready? Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Donnelly? <clears throat> yes. Both plant? No. Lalon? Yes. Leffler? No. Norris? No. Not yes. Rachelson? Yes. Christy? Yes. Verdict? No. Brad? Yes. 740. Great. Okay, thank you. And Eric, thank you so much. Great. You're welcome. Chris, thank, sure. you. And thank you, everybody else who specified and helped us uh, along the way. So thank you. So we'll be recording it and um, get this to the clerk and we can talk about it afterwards. Yeah, if we can talk about it after because I'm not certain what the procedure is right now. Sure. Thank sure. you. Okay. So great. Can I can I interrupt? Yeah, so that, please. That will not be the document that you bring to the clerk. Um, you'll be bringing a clerk uh, the the document you bring to the clerk is going to be a House Judiciary Committee amendment to S30. And I will send you, Amber that document separately um, so that uh, I, I don't know who, I don't know how you do, do it physically these days, whether somebody walks it over there or what, but um, um, to give me a, I'm just going to have the editors take a look at one little piece, that little language change we made at the end, but um, It'll be a separate document. 
Great. Thank you so much, Eric. Yep. And then I wonder if so with this emailing. I know. That's, I'm testing. I'm trying to figure that out. <laughs> I got all of the emails about a minute ago. They all came uh, There must have just been a delay. Okay. Amber <laughs> says she did finally get your email, so there must have been a delay. So hopefully, um, hopefully that problem is taken care of. Um, <laughs> Her computer crashed. Hopefully. <laughs> Are you in the pink lady today, Eric? No. Okay. So we can't just run across the. Uh, Not the end. Right. All right, cool. Yep. Okay. All right. Well, we'll just give it a little bit. We do have other witnesses. And this here. It, okay. Do we have a reporter? Um, yes, Lil is going to be the reporter, and then we should have the also the original bill that came over from the Senate. But physical, I, I think everything <clears throat> physical I had to throw out because it was from two years ago. I don't have any physical bills. No, no committee assistants have physical bills. Yeah. Um, I can get them, but everything just been emailed. Yeah, I think they okay. kept everything in the. Okay, great. All right, well, it makes sense. We here. Okay. Sounds. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. All right. We will now transition to all right, age five forty six, and actually relating to racial justice six. And we have the theater reviewer, Betty Wheeler from Vermont State Police. And thank you so much for your, for your patience as we uh, work through all of this. And I know that, um, that the commissioner also emailed some uh, testimony that we will make sure that it gets posted. Um, my understanding is that we had not heard back um, as to whether or not that he was able to testify. So, but certainly if he, if he does want to testify, we will be glad to visit with him. So, welcome. Thank you very much. Um, they did, the Department of Public Safety asked me to come here today to see if I could answer some questions if you had them. Um, my name is Betty Wheeler and I've worked for the state of Vermont for the past 29 years. And during that time, I worked as a Vermont State Police Dispatcher, a communications supervisor for E911 and State Police Dispatch. I've also worked in administrative support for the PSAP, which is the Public Safety Answering Point. And currently, I work full time for the Agency of Digital Services, and I'm assigned to the Department of Public Safety. Um, my part time hat I work for the Vermont State Police. And during that project, projects that I work for them. I do auditing and reporting. And I, a lot of what I do is uh, centered around demographics for traffic stops. So I take a look at their data, point out where there's deficiencies, where there's missing elements, send it back to them for corrections. And I summarize that for them. And I work on any other type of data projects that they come up with that they need information on. So my experience with the state police has provided me a really strong foundation um, working with the collection of the data and also managing the data and knowing what's available now in our statewide CAD RMS, which is our computer automated dispatch records management system. I'm sure you're aware that the state of Vermont um, in the past couple of months has moved all of the law enforcement agencies around the state to the same CAD RMS system except for three agencies. Um, this system was developed by a company called Crosswind, which is out of California. In the past two months, we added the 57 agencies that were left in the state of Vermont onto this system. The development of this system um, was in response to the governor's direction and executive orders 20-60 in August of uh, 2020. And this developed a standardized and mandatory statewide computer dispatch center records management system to allow us to collect data to use in looking at use of force, traffic stops, arrests, mental health issues, 
and other related topics within the CAD RMS system. The implementation of this system takes data sharing in law enforcement to a new level where we have not been in many years. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have about what is collected in this system, or I can walk you through where the data is collected and how it's collected from the beginning of an incident to the end, if you would like. Thank you, that, that would be helpful. Any, any other okay. things that can remember? Like covered, yeah, not at this point, so, so go ahead, thank you. Okay, so about 90% of the calls for service um, within the Vermont State Police are initiated by phone. And those can come from an E911 call, it can come from a direct call, it can come from um, a citizen, it can come from a neighbor, it can come from a number of different sources. And that initial call goes to a state police dispatcher in one of two PSAPs in the state. Those dispatchers collect information from each caller, hopefully, um, their name, their address, their phone number, and sometimes their date of birth, depending on the situation and what's going on. They'll get the location of the call or the complaint. They'll initiate an incident within the CAD RMS system, recording the date and time and the nature of the call. They'll then determine if this is something that actually requires a physical response by an officer or a phone call. And that, again, is going to depend on what type of data is collected by the officer. If the officer responds to that call, a lot of times they're going to be verifying the name, the address, the phone number, and the date of birth of that person. They're also going to be looking at information around specific flags, documentation that they can collect. The initial screen allows them to say, was an opiate blocker, Narcan, used on this call? Were there any mental health issues during this call? Was there domestic violence during this call? <laughs> Cargo theft? Were there any drugs involved during this call? They'll collect people detail while they're out there. They'll know whether this subject was a juvenile or an adult. Are they talking to you know, a 15-year-old, a 12-year-old, or a 40-year-old? They will get physical information on a subject, possibly. They may possibly have a photo of that subject. They'll get physical descriptions of a subject, such as the height, the weight, the build, hair color. If that person's arrested, they're going to have information such as a state identification number or an FBI number. All of these things can be recorded in our CAD RMS system. They're going to collect phone numbers, possibly an email address. They're gonna have their driver's license and the state. They may have their school. They may have their employer information. They may get an emergency contact number and a phone number. They might also, if this person is involved with the Department of Corrections, may have Department of Corrections information, such as who their probation officer is. There's many more data elements that that officer could collect or might have to collect when he responds to that scene. If he's responding to a motor vehicle accident or a motor vehicle stop or anything involving a motor vehicle. He would collect the make, the model, the year of that vehicle, the plate of that vehicle, the color, the VIN, the owner. Was there any damage to the vehicle? If the vehicle was stolen, what was the estimated value of that vehicle? The vehicle was recovered. Was there any damage to that vehicle? What's the value to that vehicle now? If that person is arrested, they're going to look at the date and time of the arrest. What are the circumstances around that arrest? Where did it occur? What were the charges? Were those charges forwarded to the state's attorney's office? Did the state's attorney prosecute? What was the outcome of that prosecution? They're going to describe property that may have been involved in this incident. That would include um, drugs. That would include items that may have been stolen. Um, they're also going to put in a value for those items if it's necessary for the report. They're going to record tickets and warnings if it's an outcome of a motor vehicle stop or a motor vehicle accident or anything, even sometimes municipal warnings. They're going to record demographics. Um, and by demographics, I mean as required by law, they're going to record the perceived race of that individual. They're going to record the sex or gender. They're going to record the age. They're going to record whether there was a search done, if any contraband was found 
What was the reason for that stop? And what was the outcome for that stop? They're also gonna re record if there was any resistance to this interaction. And if there was any resistance, what was the response that was required to bring this subject into compliance? And this is called use of force. There is a module within this new CAD RMS system that deals with use of force. But I will tell you not all agencies are currently using that yet. They have their own internal methods for recording that use of force. Of course. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much. Um, can you tell me a little bit about how uh, or whether uh, you co collect the data, how you collect the data so that there's some consistency when you might pass like cases along to the state's attorneys or as it goes to the court? I mean, are, are there some ways to have uniformity as far as how you're recording race or ethnicity, uh, name, et cetera? Within the actual CAD RMS system, there is a tab called a people tab. Within that people tab, those are drop down fields. So if we're looking at stating what the race is of someone, there's a drop down field. The choices that are there are what is based on the MCIC approved races to be used. Is that what you're referring to? I think so. It's, it's a matter of uh, just how the information um, travels. Yeah, an officer cannot ask someone their race unless it is actually for an arrest. So if that person is arrested, the officer can ask them what race they identify with, and that is what they should be recording. And that's what they're trained um, to do, is to record that information. Um, another question, if I could. How, how flexible is that system if you needed to, to adjust fields that are being collected? We are very lucky. The um, company that we partnered with for this CAD RMS, Crosswind Technologies, um, is very flexible and helps us um, modify fields, adjust on the fly what we need. Um, I think it was last year the requirement to record use of force during a motor vehicle stop was implemented, and they were able to turn that around in a relatively short amount of time so that we could start recording that. So we just work with the developer to get those changes in place as quickly as possible. I just ask one more question. Yeah, and then and then Bob has a question. Okay. So so backing up, you said it's only if there's an arrest that that race is recorded. It's not if there's just a traffic stop that doesn't if result there, in arrest. If there is a traffic stop, what is required is that the officer record the perceived race. So it is what the officer perceived that individual to be. If that subject okay. is then arrested, then the officer may ask them what race they identified with. Thank you, thank you. Huh? Yes, <clears throat> hi, Maddie, thanks for being here. You were talking about, I'm, I'm fairly familiar with this, obviously. Uh, yes. <laughs> perceive officer's perception as to the race of the individual, he or she. Uh, have you been able to establish the margin of error, plus or minus, uh, on the officer's uh, guesses or perception of races that come into contact with? No, I have not seen a study on that. Um, I know Robin um, through CRG has looked at that some, but I don't know if she has percentages available as to what known race is versus the perceived race. So just to make it clear, Betty, what you're saying is if someone's arrested, the officers can ask their race. If they're issued a ticket and or a warning, uh, they simply, once again, have to fill both of those tickets out and it's based on perception. Correct. They're totally different data sets. They're not tied together so that we can look at what the officer perceived this person to be versus what they identified with. Okay, thank you, Betty. Yes. Um, Rachel Sin has her hand up. Barbara, go ahead. Thanks. I'm wondering if that's the same situation for gender in terms of perceived gender? Normally that is something they are taking from the license at a motor vehicle stop. And okay. that is whatever the person has reported to the Department of Motor Vehicles that they want on their license for gender, whether it is male, female, or X. And there are several states across the nation now mm -hmm. that do have X as a, as a gender. 
And do you keep data on how many times what the officer thought and what then was reported? Um, for gender? For, no. for either, for either. For race, yes. We, um, I know that CRG um, Robin has looked at that. I honestly don't know what those results are, but for gender, no, we do not. Okay. And I'm not and, aware that it's been done. And if somebody does not want to answer the question, what happens? Then it's put as refused. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. No, no questions at, at this point. So please continue. Thank you. Um, one of the things that I wear for a hat for the Vermont State Police is I do data audits for them. So what I do is I look at the information that has been entered into the system to make sure that there's no missing data. If I find that there is a point where um, they're not recording outcome of a motor vehicle stop, what happens is I send that information back to the individual barracks saying, you know, this data is missing and they work to correct that. A um, couple of the other studies that I've done is looked at um, arrests to make sure that that information is complete. I think the commissioner also did send a memo in um, from the Department of Public Safety regarding his position summary as well. Thank you. And if that is not <laughs> posted already, it will be posted. But I do see that the commissioner is on the phone if he would like to uh, to join us. Good afternoon, Commissioner. Good afternoon. I would be with you by Zoom, but um, I got locked out. I don't think Zoom likes me very much. Uh, um, I, I think I'm, Apologies. I'm no sweat. Uh, if that's a, the biggest bump in, in uh, all of today's work, that's uh, that's fine. Um, I did provide uh, some written testimony uh, or written position summary and happy to answer uh, any questions folks have. In general, um, we're supportive um, of uh, robust uh, availability of data. Uh, one of the reasons we moved to this new system among many uh, was to eventually create a far more data transparency, uh, both in the form of publicly available dashboards so uh, the public can see and drill into uh, information about uh, law enforcement and other emergency service responses, uh, and also eventually to have uh, data publicly available on open portals um, so that researchers, uh, students, and uh, the public in general may have an interest in, in inquiring of that data and asking questions of it that we haven't even begun uh, to contemplate could do so uh, and do uh, additional research. So, General concerns we have are just to ensure that uh, whatever uh, comes to pass here uh, ensures that um, it has deference to the, the various legal overlays. And I know there's been an effort uh, to try to do that in the, in the first draft, but uh, just of note, there are a number of, uh, of federal laws and regulations that relate to personally identifying information. And we just wanna make sure, of course, that uh, as we're uh, making information as widely available to to folks as possible, not only on uh, racial justice statistics, but uh, really to be able to inquire of the data, uh, really anything that we have in our possession eventually, um, that's done with deference to personal identifying information. And uh, we've also flagged safety. Um, no secret that people's information is mined in a variety of ways, and we wouldn't want our data to somehow be commingled with other data that could be mined from other sources and somehow create safety risks for individuals. Um, that's uh, that's the high level overview. Happy to uh, uh, answer any questions uh, or uh, get out of the committee's way at your discretion. Thank you very much. We do um, have one hand up at this point. Uh, Representative Lund, go ahead, Martin. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Shirley. Um, just one comment and then also one question. Uh, the issues that you raised in your memo, which I had a chance to really briefly take a look at, uh, I, I do believe we are going to be getting those pretty well addressed in a, an amendment uh, that I've been working with legislative council on that uh, 
I think we have a scheduled walkthrough on Friday afternoon. So we'll appreciate uh, if you or your staff have a chance to take a look at that. Uh, when that comes up, see if it, if it helps with some of those concerns uh, that you have uh, regarding privacy and, and uh, on the other hand, transparency, trying to thread that needle. Uh, the question I have is uh, one of the things that we are adding in the amendment is to make sure that the division complies with the criminal justice information services guidelines. Uh, this is uh, from uh, Kristen McClure had suggested that. Are, are, besides that and the Public Records Act, are there other particular concerns regarding, I mean, presumably we don't have to put in any laws that you have to comply with because they have to comply with them, but just to be doubly sure, you know, we, we, we want to put in, for instance, the CJIS, but are there others that you think that we should specifically point out uh, in this legislation? Um, I don't know. Uh, I leave to your discretion whether it makes sense to specifically point them out. There are federal regulations uh, and laws about uh, uh, we're required to bifurcate uh, juvenile records from adult records, for example. And there are a host of, of those sort of nuanced um, regulatory things around uh, law enforcement data uh, in addition to the CJIS compliance. Um, it may not make sense to to sort of get in and try to dig out all of the nuances, but just to uh, maybe a blanket statement about ensuring compliance, uh, both because it's hard to, to, to be sure that we have a comprehensive list and uh, federal regulations can change. So if it, has, if it has a blanket statement, then it's flexible enough to not need uh, to be tinkered with if the federal government changes <coughs> their regulations. All right, I appreciate that, thank you. Yeah. Um, I think this question's for Betty, um, other than the commissioner, but hello. <laughs> um, so Betty, the, the information that you're working with, um, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but is it kind of your job to uh, make sure of the accuracy of it? What I look for is missing data elements, and then I refer that back to the individual barracks to make sure that that information is collected and that it's entered into the CAD RMS system. I don't look at the data as far as accuracy about reporting what the trooper sees. That is definitely goes back to the individual barracks to make sure that that is correct. And I don't modify any of the data. So um, if I see that you know there's a lot of missing stuff, then I go back to them. Or if it doesn't make sense, then I send it back to them. Okay, no, and, and I, I mean, being a lay person, I guess I would consider that uh, um, um, looking at the accuracy of the data. But uh, the, the data that you're collecting, is it just uh, from state police? The data within the statewide CAD RMS system is statewide. The only data that I have worked with belongs to the Vermont State Police. I have done other reports out of the statewide CAD RMS that is sanitized data, which means there's no personable identifying information and that it doesn't relate specifically back to an individual agency. It's compiled statewide. So I report out how many domestic violence cases there were statewide, but I don't report how many belong to Bennington PD or how many belong to Burlington PD. Okay, um, and I guess around uh, traffic stops and that type of thing, uh, do, do you see that data also? Because uh, I'm just wondering if anybody's collecting that data from the municipalities or you know, local police departments. That data is collected yearly um, by the uh, police academy. <clears throat> okay, so is anybody uh, for the local police departments or even sheriffs, is, is anybody looking at that information to make sure it's, uh, I guess uh, the word would be complete going forward? Because I know we've um, had issues with some, um, with some locals. The state police has a fair and impartial policing uh, board and it's open to everyone and all municipalities. They have in the past offered um, services from them as well as from myself to teach them how to do these audits that I do. Several agencies have taken us up on that audit. 
um, as far as making sure that every agency is reporting. Um, in the past, I have looked at the previous system, Spillman, to make sure that every agency that was on Spillman was entering that data, but it was not audited for completeness. Only the state police data was. Okay, great, thank you. <clears throat> yes. Okay, thank you. We are all set. Thank you very much. Very helpful. I'm not seeing anybody, any committee members on Zoom with their hands. Up. So thank you. And again, I appreciate your, your patience and while we work through some uh, technical issues on the last bill and, um, and unfortunately did not get to you on the time we had scheduled, but thank you so much. Thank you. With that.